السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters and dear viewers We are still elaborating on our topic 40 tips for reforming our homes and we have covered so far seven tips and we'll carry on tip number eight teaching the family members educating them teaching them because this is the responsibility of the head of the family and at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the women the asked their husbands because they were the ones who would go and sit with the Prophet ﷺ, and they would hear from him the revealed scripture, what Allah revealed, and what the Prophet ﷺ also said. So they would memorize the revealed Quranic verses and the prophetic traditions, sayings. So when they go back to their homes, the first thing their wives would ask them, sit down and teach me and tell me what Allah sent down upon his prophet so teaching the family this is tip number eight tip number nine we should have an Islamic library at home a library which contains different types of books covering various topics books addressing the issue of fiqh the Islamic jurisprudence things related to the ibadah, siyam, salah, zakah. These are the books they address these issues, the fiqh issues. Books they address the belief, the issues of iman, the issues of the belief in the angels, etc. And they are, mashallah, beautiful books available. Books on the seerah, the biography of the Prophet ﷺ. Because every Muslim should know about his Prophet. Unfortunately, yeah, many people, they just had an idea, but most of these ideas are vague. They don't know the details. They don't know the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, though the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is the practical implementation of the Sharia, the Islamic teachings. So you should know about the Prophet ﷺ, you should know about his manners, his characters, his physical features, which we call them Shama'il. So you should know how the Prophet ﷺ looks. So if you see him in the dream, you know that one whom you saw in your dream is really the Prophet ﷺ. But if you don't know how the Prophet ﷺ looks, how can you tell that that one was the Prophet ﷺ or not? Because the possibility is there that the shaitan would come and deceive you. And he would tell you, I am the Prophet ﷺ, because you don't know him. And he might tell you something that goes against the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. Because some people, they say, but it is impossible that the shaitan comes and tells you that he is the Prophet when he is not. That's not true. Because there is a misunderstanding about the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He who sees me in the dream, he sees me in reality. Because the shaitan cannot take my resemblance, cannot come in my exact shape and character, cannot. But he can take any other form and can mislead you and uh, tell you something which goes against the teachings of Islam in totality. It happened to Imam Abdul Qadir Jilani, rahimahullah, this great Imam, which many people they are saying things and attribute things to him, which is not true. He was a monotheist, he was a humbly. Is very righteous. So one night he was praying at night to Hajjah. And all of a sudden light appeared in the room. And the voice came. Oh Abdul Qadir Jilani. I am Allah. I'm your Lord. There's no need for you to worship me anymore. Imam Abdul Qadir Rahim Allah was a scholar. 
He knew this is from the shaitan. So he said, by Allah, are you Allah? And guess what happened? That light vanished, disappeared. And after that, the voice came back. Oh, Abdul Qadir, you escaped. I failed to mislead you. It was the shaitan. It was the shaitan. But that's why we need to know the features and how the Prophet ﷺ looks like. The complexion, his stature, etc. So that is always addressed in the books of the Shama'il and the Sirah. You should also have books on Hadith. Bukhari, Muslim, Nisa'i, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawood. Well, these are the famous books that contain the Hadith and the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ. Also, the library should have books for children. And alhamdulillah, there are good books for children. Addressing and teaching the children according to the way a child would uh, comprehend something easy to digest for a child. So the children, they know there is a corner in this library that has books for us. A woman also, she knows there are books addressing women issues, you know, menses, things like that. So women issues. So the library should have books that address all the needs of the family. Tip number 10 should also have audio library where there are Islamic lectures, DVDs, or CDs, so you can listen to. When you are driving, you are listening to at home also. The wife can put that CD and listen to while she is doing her daily chores, etc. Tip number 11, inviting the righteous and the students of knowledge and the scholars to your home. Why? When you have scholars in your home, See the children, the impact of that on the children. Oh, scholar so-and-so is our guest today. So they are only exposed to the cream of the community. The most righteous ones, they see the humility, the humbleness of this alim, this scholar. The manners, the kindness. Children, they come to this scholar. He hugs them. He prays for them. So they start to love the scholars. So invite people of knowledge to be your guests. Students of knowledge. And when you get together, you don't waste your time, of course. You will just pick a book, reading something, discussing something. Something is beneficial. Something that renews one's iman. This was the, the practice of the Sahaba, Radhanallah alayhim. Whenever they met, they would ask each other, let us sit for a while and renew our iman. So inviting the righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that on that day, on the day of resurrection, the friends, The friends on the day, on that day, on the day of resurrection, will be enemies to each other, except the righteous. The righteous. The righteous, they will not have enmity or hatred on that day. They love each other. May Allah make us among the righteous, those who love each other for his sake. Stay tuned, my dear brothers and sisters and dear viewers. We'll see you after the break. Look at me, let me know. Family. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Assalatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We were talking before the break about tip number 11 and that is inviting the righteous, the learned men to your home and always your friends should be the righteous, always the righteous people should be your guests so that the children, they see only good people who come to their home. The practice of the Sahaba, Radhanallah alayhim, whenever they met they would ask each other let us sit for a while and renew our iman so inviting the righteous allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
tells us that on that day, on the day of resurrection, the friends, the friends on the day, on that day, on the day of resurrection, will be enemies to each other, except the righteous. The righteous. The righteous, they will not have enmity or hatred on that day. They love each other. And the Islamic rulings, the ahkam al-shari'iyya, the Islamic rulings that are relevant and specially meant for the Muslim home. For instance, you, that you're praying the nafil prayers at home. See, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that you pray for the men, you pray the five prayers in the masjid, but it is highly recommended that the sunnah, the nafil, the sunnah, should be prayed at home. And as a matter of fact, he said you should not make your homes look like graveyards. The graveyards, you cannot pray in the graveyards. So if your house, you don't pray the nafil prayers, and no one prays in that house, it will be just look like the graveyard. So that's why it is better to pray the nafil, the sunnah, at home. And the reward is greater than praying it in the masjid of the Prophet Also, the host leads the guests. This is the sunnah. I have guests, it is the host, is the one who leads the jama'ah. If the masjid, of course, is far away and there's no masjid in the locality, and I have guests, and now time for the salah, so it is the host who will lead the salah. Unless the host himself decides because there is a alim, there is half of Quran among the guests, they said, no, you lead. In that case, the one whom the guest chose should lead the jama'ah. So we know that Ibn Mas'ud, عنه, he had guests and they were having their meals and they missed the jama'ah actually. When they went to the masjid, they found that the jama'ah, the congregation finished. So Ibn Mas'ud and his guests, they went to the house, to Ibn Mas'ud's house, and they prayed there. So the host leads the guests in the salah. Also seeking permission before entering. These are, these are rulings in Islam. You don't just enter someone's house like that without seeking permission. You have to ask for permission. You knock. Three times the Prophet ﷺ said, you use the knocker, olden days knockers, now the bell. Three knocks, and if no one replied, you just leave. Not that you keep knocking, knocking, no. The same thing now about the bells, only three rings. One, wait. Another one, and wait. Third one, and leave. Don't keep pressing the bell like that to wake everyone. Because maybe the family, they are not prepared to receive guests. Maybe someone is sick and you are keeping disturbing and pressing the bell. Children are sleeping. So only three and you leave. And you should not feel upset. I came and I rang the bell more than three times and you didn't open. So what? I was not in a position to receive you. So you should not feel bad about it. So Islam, my dear brothers and sisters, Islam teaches us everything. As a matter of fact, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us that there are certain times when you cannot visit the people. So Islam, alhamdulillah, teaches us these etiquettes and these manners. So seeking permission before entering. Also, teach their children not to enter their parents' rooms. The parents' room, the bedroom. Children should not just open the door and... No, they have to knock and they have to ask. And they should know. This time, no disturbance. A man asked the Prophet ﷺ, even I have to seek permission upon entering, even if the one who's inside is my mother. He said, yes, do you want to see your mother naked? That's why you have to seek permission. Tip number 13. Family, get together to discuss family issues. My dear brothers and sisters, do it, please. Oh, Muslim families and non-Muslim families alike, always get together. Oh, everyone, mother, husband, father, children, sons, daughters, everyone, together to discuss the issues of the family. We have one day a week. This is, we get together and we sit and we have open discussion and we listen to everyone. 
What do you think? What's your opinion? What do you think? And we take notes of all this. We do this brainstorming. And you never know. Maybe this little one will come with a brilliant idea. Yes. So this is very important. The family, they get together to discuss family issues. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear. In the Quran, Surah 42, verse 38. وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ who conduct their affairs by mutual consultation. Mutual consultation. They discuss their affairs. They listen. The Prophet ﷺ, when he went with the Sahaba to Mecca, this is called Umrah, and the Mushriks, they stopped them, the pagans, they stopped them from entering Mecca. You know the whole thing. And they reach an agreement with the Mushriks that they should not enter this year to Mecca, but the year to follow. And the Sahaba, they were already in a state of ihram, already wearing the clothes of ihram, because their intention was to, to do the Umrah. And now they have to remove the ihram. So the Prophet ﷺ told them now, remove your ihram. They were hesitant. They were reluctant. He told them, but they were reluctant. The question is, why were they reluctant? Did they mean to disobey the Prophet ﷺ? The answer, absolutely not. They were reluctant because they were hoping that Allah would send something, a revelation commanding his Prophet to enter Mecca forcefully. The Prophet ﷺ, he got upset, very angry. And he went to his wife, one of his wives, I think of Musalama. And he said, the Muslims are perished. I asked them to remove their ihrams and they were reluctant. Listen to what Umm Salama anha said. They don't blame them, our Prophet of Allah. They were longing to go for Umrah and now the mushriks stopped them. So they are hurt deeply. So don't blame them. But what you should do, go outside, call the barber to shave your hair. And don't say a word to them. Here the Prophet ﷺ, he listened and he is the Prophet of Allah. He took that valuable piece of advice from his wife and he came out and he started shaving his hair. When they saw that, all of them started doing the same thing. So we should listen to each other and seek the advice of each other. And that also will come only when we discuss and have this shura, this mutual and reciprocal consultation. Tip number 14, and this is for the husband and wife. Never, never show your marital problems in front of your children. Children should always see you cheerful, smiling, though you have problems. Your problems are kept there between the four walls in your bedroom. You step outside, husband is smiling to the front of children, cheerful, the same thing the wife. So we should not make, remember, we should make our home paradise on earth, not hell on earth. Because if the children, they always see their parents quarreling, fighting, this affects them badly. Psychiatrists can tell you. A child is sitting in the classroom, teacher is explaining, and he is totally absent-minded. He's somewhere else. But is echoing only the fight. The voice of his father screaming at his mother, or the mother screaming at her husband. That's what is echoing. And he is only imagining that. So he's not listening to what the teacher is explaining to them. So that's why it's very essential to have a peaceful home. So keep your problems to yourselves. And try, a husband and wife, to sit and try to solve your problems among yourselves. Tip number 15, you should not have the wicked ones who are your guests and friends because they will have negative, not positive, impact on your children. For instance, may Allah guide all the Muslims. If 
your friends are wicked ones, people who are impious, they come home, they smoke, live alone, or let alone other stuff, haram stuff they are doing. So if the children, they see only the bad things that the guests are doing, then that means you are giving the children an idea that these things are okay and they will learn bad habits from the guests that uh, visit them and come to their home. So do not, as the Prophet ﷺ said in Musnad Ahmad, he said ﷺ and Tirmidhi, man is influenced by the faith of his friends, therefore be careful for whom you associate with. Be careful. In Arabic they say, a sahib sahib, a friend is a puller, he will pull you. So here the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, the ones that will always improve you, when they see you do something wrong, they will tell you, brother, fear Allah, sister, fear Allah. This is the real friend. Friend indeed is a friend in need. Those who will stand by you when you are in need. So that is why here the Prophet ﷺ said, do not choose the bad ones, choose the good friend. And you know the hadith that what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, the parable of the good friend and the bad friend. The good friend is like the person who sells perfume. And the likeness of the bad friend is like the blacksmith, where you only get bad smell or maybe a spark that will burn your clothes. So we have to have good friends like the perfume. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our iman and ding our hearts together and protect our homes. Ameen. And Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim. Islam, I believe.